Paul McNeely from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas. September 3rd, 2006. Dear Jane, dear winsome Jane, How you stole in the room where I lay so ill, In your nurse's cap and linen cuffs, And took my hand and said with a smile, You are not so ill, you'll soon be well. And how the liquid thought of your eyes Sank in my eyes like dew that slips Into the heart of a flower. Dear Jane, the whole McNeely fortune could not have bought your care of me, by day and night and night and day, nor paid for your smile nor the warmth of your soul, in your little hands laid on my brow. Jane, till the flame of life went out in the dark above the disk of night, I longed and hoped to be well again, to pillow my head on your little breasts and hold you fast in a clasp of love. Did my father provide for you when he died, Jane? Dear Jane? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mary McNeely from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Kristen Hughes. Passerby. To love is to find your own soul through the soul of the beloved one. When the beloved one withdraws itself from your soul, then you have lost your soul. It is written, I have a friend, but my sorrow has no friend. Hence my long years of solitude at the home of my father, trying to get myself back and to turn my sorrow into a supremer self. But there was my father with his sorrows, sitting under the cedar tree, a picture that sank into my heart at last, bringing infinite repose. O ye souls who have made life fragrant and white as tube roses from earth's dark soil, eternal peace. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Daniel McCumber from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Michael Rowe. Daniel McCumber When I went to the city, Mary McNeely, I meant to return for you. Yes, I did. But Laura, my landlady's daughter, stole into my life somehow and won me away. Then, after some years, whom should I meet but Georgine Minor from Niles? a sprout of the free-love fourierist gardens that flourished before the war all over Ohio. Her dilettante lover had tired of her, and she turned to me for strength and solace. She was some kind of a crying thing one takes in one's arms, and all at once it slimes your face with its running nose and voids its essence all over you, then bites your hand and springs away. And there you stand, bleeding and smelling to heaven, why, Mary McNeely, I was not worthy to kiss the hem of your robe. End of Daniel McCumber This recording is in the public domain. Number 103, Georgine Sandminer from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Victoria Long A stepmother drove me from my home in bitter in me. A squall man, a flaneur and dilettante, took my virtue. For years I was his mistress. No one knew. I learned from him the parasite cunning with which I moved with the bluff like a flea on a dog. All the time I was nothing but very private with different men. Then Daniel, the radical, had me for years. His sister called me his mistress and Daniel wrote me shameful words for an our beautiful love. But my anger coiled, preparing its fangs. My lesbian friend next took a hand. She hated Daniel's sister, and Daniel despised her midget husband, and she saw a chance for poisonous thrust. I must complain to the wife of Daniel's pursuit. Before I did that, I begged him to fly to London with me. Why not stay in the city, just as we have? he asked. 
Then I turned submarine and revenged his repulse in the arms of my dilettante friend. Then up to the surface, bearing the letter that Daniel wrote me, to prove my honor was all intact, showing it to his wife, my lesbian friend, and everyone. If Daniel had only shot me dead, instead of stripping me naked of lies, a harlot in body and soul. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Thomas Rhodes from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Dan Three Trees. Very well, you liberals and navigators into realms intellectual, you sailors through heights imaginative, blown about by erratic currents tumbling into air pockets, you Margaret Fuller Slacks, Pettits, and Tennessee Claflin Shopes, you found with all your boasted wisdom how hard at the last it is to keep the soul from splitting into cellular atoms, while we, seekers of Earth's treasures, getters and hoarders of gold, are self-contained, compact, harmonized, even to the end. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ida Chicken from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Chris the Girl. After I had attended lectures at our Chautauqua and studied French for twenty years, committing the grammar almost by heart, I thought I'd take a trip to Paris to give my culture a final polish. So I went to Peoria for a passport. Thomas Rhodes was on the train that morning. And there, the clerk of the district court made me swear to support and defend the Constitution. Yes, even me, who couldn't defend or support it at all. And what do you think? That very morning, the federal judge, in the very next room to the room where I took the oath, decided the Constitution exempted roads from paying taxes for the waterworks of Spoon River. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Pennywit, the Artist, from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters, read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake, in Long Branch, New Jersey, on July 21, 2006, PaintedRiceCakes.org. I lost my patronage in Spoon River from trying to put my mind in the camera to catch the soul of the person. The very best picture I ever took was of Judge Somers, attorney at law. He sat upright and had me pause until he got his cross-eyed straight. And when he was ready, he said, all right, and I yelled, overruled, and his eye turned up. And I caught him just as he used to look when saying, I accept. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Jim Brown from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Ralph Clapis. October 20th, 2006, Valparaiso, Indiana. While I was handling Dom Pedro, I got at the thing that divides the race between men who are for singing turkey in the straw, or there is a fountain filled with blood, like Ryle Potter used to sing it over at Concord, for cards, or for Reverend Pete's lecture on the Holy Land, for skipping the light fantastic, or passing the plate, for pinafore, or a Sunday school cantata, for men, or for money, for the people, or against them. This was it. Reverend Pete and the Social Purity Club, headed by Ben Pantier's wife, went to the village trustees and asked them to make me take Dom Pedro from the barn of Wash McNeely, there at the edge of town, to a barn outside of the corporation, on the ground that it corrupted public morals. Well, 
Ben Pantier and Fiddler Jones saved the day. They thought it a slam on Colts. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Robert Davidson from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas September 6, 2006 I grew spiritually fat, living off the souls of men. If I saw a soul that was strong, I wounded its pride and devoured its strength. The shelters of friendship knew my cunning, for where I could steal a friend, I did so and wherever I could enlarge my power by undermining ambition, I did so, thus to make smooth my own, and to triumph over other souls just to assert and prove my superior strength was with me a delight, the keen exhilaration of soul gymnastics. Devouring souls, I should have lived forever, but their undigested remains bred in me a deadly nephritis. With fear, restlessness, sinking spirits, hatred, suspicion, vision disturbed, I collapsed at last with a shriek. Remember the acorn. It does not devour other acorns. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Elza Wertman from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Laura Fox of ShiningHalf.com I was a peasant girl from Germany, blue-eyed, rosy, happy and strong, and the first place I worked was at Thomas Green's. On a summer's day, when she was away, he stole into the kitchen and took me right in his arms, and kissed me on my throat, I turning my head. Then neither of us seemed to know what happened, and I cried for what would become of me, and cried and cried as my secret began to show. One day Mrs. Green said she understood, and would make no trouble for me, and, being childless, would adopt it. He had given her a farm to be still." So she hid in the house, and sent out rumors, as if it were going to happen to her. And all went well, and the child was born. They were so kind to me. Later I married Gus Wertman, and years passed. But at political rallies, when sitters by thought I was crying, at the eloquence of Hamilton Green, that was not it. No, I wanted to say— that's my son. That's my son. Recorded May 26th, 2006. This recording is in the public domain. Number 110, Hamilton Green. From the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read by Sean McGahey for LibriVox.org. December 29th, 2006 I was the only child of Francis Harris of Virginia and Thomas Green of Kentucky. Of valiant and honorable blood both, to them I owe all that I became, judge, member of Congress, leader in the state. From my mother I inherited vivacity, fancy, language. From my father, will, judgment, logic. All honor to them, for what service I was to the people. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ernest Hyde from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Rappel Ernest Hyde My mind was a mirror. It saw what I saw. It knew what I knew. In youth my mind was just a mirror in a rapidly flying car which catches and loses bits of the landscape. Then in time great scratches were made on the mirror letting the outside world come in and letting my inner self look out. 
for this is the birth of the soul in sorrow, a birth with gains and losses. The mind sees the world as a thing apart, and the soul makes the world at one with itself. A mirror scratched reflects no image, and this is the silence of wisdom. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Roger Heston from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Aaron Decker Oh, how many times did Ernest Hyde and I argue about the freedom of the will? My favorite metaphor was Prickett's cow roped out to grass, and free, you know, as far as the length of the rope. One day, while arguing so, watching the cow pull at the rope to get beyond the circle which she had eaten bare, out came the stake, and tossing up her head, she ran for us. "'What's that? Free will or what?' said Ernest, running. I fell, just as she gored me to my death. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Amos Sibley from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters, read for LibriVox.org by Dan Three Trees. Not character, not fortitude, not patience were mine, the which the village thought I had, in bearing with my wife while preaching on, doing the work God chose for me. I loathed her as a termagant, as a wanton. I knew of her adulteries, every one, but even so, if I divorced the woman, I must forsake the ministry. Therefore, to do God's work and have it crop, I bore with her. So lied I to myself, so lied I to Spoon River. Yet I tried lecturing, ran for the legislature, canvassed for books, with just the thought in mind. If I make money thus, I will divorce her. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mrs. Sibley from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org The Secret of the Stars Gravitation The Secret of the Earth Layers of Rock The Secret of the Soil To Receive Seed The Secret of the Seed The Germ The Secret of Man The Sower The Secret of Woman The Soil my secret, under a mound that you shall never find. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Adam Weirock from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas September 12, 2006 I was crushed between Altgeld and Armour. I lost many friends, much time and money fighting for Altgeld, whom editor Whedon denounced as the candidate of gamblers and anarchists. Then Armour started to ship dressed meat to Spoon River, forcing me to shut down my slaughterhouse, and my butcher shop went all to pieces. The new forces of Altgeld and Armour caught me at the same time. I thought it due me to recoup the money I lost and to make good the friends that left me, for the governor to appoint me canal commissioner. Instead, he appointed Whedon of the Spoon River Argus. So I ran for the legislature and was elected. I said to hell with principle and sold my vote on Charles T. Yerke's streetcar franchise. Of course, I was one of the fellows they caught. Who was it? Armour, Altgeld, or myself, that ruined me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Number 116. Ezra Bartlett. From the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Sean McGahey. December 29, 2006. A chaplain in the army, 
a chaplain in the prisons, an exhorter in Spoon River, drunk with divinity, Spoon River, yet bringing poor Eliza Johnson to shame and myself to scorn and wretchedness. But why will you never see that love of women and even love of wine are the stimulants by which the soul, hungering for divinity, reaches the ecstatic vision and sees the celestial outposts? Only after many trials for strength, only when all stimulants fail, does the aspiring soul, by its own sheer power, find the divine by resting upon itself. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Amelia Garrick from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Laura Fox of ShiningHalf.com. Yes, here I lie close to a stunted rose bush in a forgotten place near the fence, where the thickets from Seaver's woods have crept over, growing sparsely. And you, you are a leader in New York, the wife of a noted millionaire, a name in the society columns, beautiful, admired, magnified, perhaps, by the mirage of distance. You have succeeded. I have failed in the eyes of the world. You are alive. I am dead. Yet I know that I vanquished your spirit. And I know that lying here far from you, unheard of among your great friends in the brilliant world where you move, I am really the unconquerable power over your life that robs it of complete triumph. Recorded May 10th, 2006. This recording is in the public domain. John Hancock Otis from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Dan Denning LostSinner.com As to democracy, fellow citizens, are you not prepared to admit that I, who inherited riches and was to the manner born, was second to none in Spoon River in my devotion to the cause of liberty? While my contemporary, Anthony Findlay, born in a shanty and beginning life, as a water carrier to the section hands, then becoming a section hand when he was grown, afterwards foreman of the gang, until he rose to the superintendency of the railroad. Living in Chicago was a veritable slave driver, grinding the faces of labor, and a bitter enemy of democracy. And I say to you, Spoon River, and to you, O Republic, beware of the man who rises to power from one suspender. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. One hundred and nineteen Anthony Finley from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox by Simon Keating. Both for the country and for the man, and for a country as well as a man, tis better to be feared than loved. And if this country would rather part with the friendship of every nation than surrender its wealth, I say of a man tis worse to lose money than friends. And I ran the curtain that hides the soul of an ancient aspiration. When the people clamor for freedom, they really seek for power over the strong. I, Anthony Finley, rising to greatness from a humble water carrier, until I could say to thousands, come, and say to thousands, go, affirm that a nation can never be good or achieve the good where the strong and the wise have not the rod to use on the dull and the weak. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. John Cabanis from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas September 11, 2006 Neither spite, fellow citizens, 
nor forgetfulness of the shiftlessness and the lawlessness and waste under democracy's rule in Spoon River made me desert the party of law and order and lead the liberal party. Fellow citizens, I saw as one with second sight that every man of the millions of men who give themselves to freedom and fail while freedom fails, enduring waste and lawlessness and the rule of the weak and the blind, dies in the hope of building earth like the coral insect for the temple to stand on at the last. And I swear that freedom will wage to the end the war for making every soul wise and strong and as fit to rule as Plato's lofty guardians in a world republic girdled. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Unknown from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Elizabeth Palmer Ye aspiring ones, listen to the story of the unknown who lies here with no stone to mark the place. As a boy reckless and wanton, wandering with gun in hand through the forest near the mansion of Aaron Hatfield, I shot a hawk perched on top of a dead tree. He fell with guttural cry at my feet, his wing broken. Then I put him in a cage where he lived many days cawing angrily at me when I offered him food. Daily I searched the realms of Hades for the soul of the hawk, that I may offer him the friendship of one whom life wounded and caged. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Alexander Throckmorton from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Maddie In youth my wings were strong and tireless, but I did not know the mountains. In age I knew the mountains, but my weary wings could not follow my vision. Genius is wisdom and youth. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Jonathan Swift Summers from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Samantha Hayes After you have enriched your soul to the highest point with books, thought, suffering, the understanding of many personalities, the power to interpret glances, silences, the pauses in momentous transformations, the genius of divination and prophecy, so that you feel able at times to hold the world in the hollow of your hand. Then, if, by the crowding of so many powers into the compass of your soul, your soul takes fire, and in the conflagration of your soul the evil of the world is lighted up and made clear, be thankful if in that hour of supreme vision life does not fiddle. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Widow McFarlane From Spoon River Anthology By Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org By Annie Coleman I was the Widow McFarlane, Weaver of carpets for all the village, And I pity you still at the loom of life, You who are singing to the shuttle, and lovingly watching the work of your hands, if you reach the day of hate, of terrible truth. For the cloth of life is woven, you know, to a pattern hidden under the loom, a pattern you never see. And you weave high-hearted, singing, singing. You guard the threads of love and friendship for noble figures in gold and purple, and long after other eyes can see you have woven a moon-white strip of cloth, you laugh in your strength, for hope o'erlays it, with shapes of love and beauty. The loom stops short, the pattern's out, you're alone in the room. You have woven a shroud, and hate of it lays you in it. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Carl Hamblin from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas
September 13, 2006 The press of the Spoon River Clarion was wrecked, and I was tarred and feathered, for publishing this on the day the anarchists were hanged in Chicago. I saw a beautiful woman with bandaged eyes standing on the steps of a marble temple. Great multitudes passed in front of her, lifting their faces to her imploringly. In her left hand she held a sword. She was brandishing the sword, sometimes striking a child, again a laborer, again a slinking woman, again a lunatic. In her right hand she held a scale. Into the scale pieces of gold were tossed by those who dodged the strokes of the sword. A man in a black gown read from a manuscript, She is no respecter of persons. Then a youth wearing a red cap leaped to her side and snatched away the bandage. And lo, the lashes had been eaten away from the oozy eyelids. The eyeballs were seared with a milky mucus. The madness of a dying soul was written on her face. But the multitude saw why she wore the bandage. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Editor Wheaton from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Matthew O'Meara, 10, 19, 2006. To be able to see every side of every question, to be on every side, to be everything, to be nothing long, to pervert truth, to write it for a purpose, to use great feelings and passions of the human family, for base designs, for cunning ends, to wear a mask like the Greeks' actors, your eight-page paper behind which you huddle, bawling through the megaphone of big type, this is I, the giant, thereby also living the life of a sneak thief, poisoned with the anonymous words of your clandestine soul, to scratch dirt over scandal for money and exhume it to the winds for revenge, or to sell papers, crushing reputations or bodies if need be, to win at any cost, save your own life, to glory in demoniac power ditching civilization, as a paranoiac boy puts a log on the track and derails the express train, to be an editor, as I was, then to lie here, close by the river over the place where the sewage flows from the village, and the empty cans and garbage are dumped, and abortions are hidden. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Eugene Carmen, from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters, read for LibriVox.org by Michael Rowe. Eugene Carmen, Rhodes Slave, selling shoes and gingham, flour and bacon, overalls, clothing, all day long, for fourteen hours a day, for three hundred and thirteen days, for more than twenty years saying yes'm and yes sir and thank you a thousand times a day and all for fifty dollars a month living in this stinking room in the rattletrap commercial and compelled to go to sunday school and to listen to the reverend abner pete one hundred and four times a year for more than an hour at a time because thomas rhodes ran the church as well as the store and the bank so while I was tying my necktie that morning, I suddenly saw myself in the glass. My hair all gray, my face like a sodden pie. So I cursed and cursed, you damned old thing, you cowardly dog, you rotten pauper, you road slave. Till Roger Bauman thought I was having a fight with someone and looked through the transom just in time to see me fall on the floor in a heap from a broken vein in my head. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Clarence Fawcett from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Greg Ahi. October 2nd, 2006 in Anchorage, Alaska. 
The sudden death of Eugene Carmen put me in line to be promoted to $50 a month, and I told my wife and children that night. But it didn't come, and so I thought Old Road suspected me of stealing the blankets I took and sold on the side for money to pay a doctor's bill for my little girl. Then, like a bold, Old Rhodes accused me, and promised me mercy for my family's sake if I confessed. So I confessed, and begged him to keep it out of the papers, and I asked the editors, too. That night at home, the constable took me, and every paper, except the clarion, wrote me up as a thief because Old Rhodes was an advertiser and wanted to make an example of me. Oh, well, you know how the children cried, and how my wife pitied and hated me, and how I came to lie here. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. W. Lloyd Garrison Standard From the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by David Barnes Vegetarian, non-resistant, free thinker, In ethics a Christian, Orator, apt at the rhinestone rhythm of Ingersoll, carnivorous, avenger, believer and pagan, continent, promiscuous, changeable, treacherous, vain, proud with the pride that makes struggle a thing for laughter, with heart cored out by the worm of theatric despair wearing the coat of indifference to hide the shame of defeat. I, child of the abolitionist idealism, a sort of brand in a birth of half and half. What other thing could happen when I defended the patriot scamps who burned the courthouse, that Spoon River might have a new one, than plead them guilty? When Kinsey Keen drove through the cardboard mask of my life with a spear of light, what could I do but slink away like the beast of myself which I raised from a whelp to a corner and growl? The pyramid of my life was naught but a dune, barren and formless, spoiled at last by the storm. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Professor Newcomer from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas. September 3rd, 2006. Everyone laughed at Colonel Pritchard for buying an engine so powerful that it wrecked itself and wrecked the grinder he ran it with. But here's a joke of cosmic size. The urge of nature that made a man evolve from his brain a spiritual life. Oh, miracle of the world! The very same brain with which the ape and wolf get food and shelter and procreate themselves. Nature has made man do this, in a world where she gives him nothing to do after all though the strength of his soul goes round in a futile waste of power to gear itself to the mills of the gods, but get food and shelter and procreate himself. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ralph Rhodes from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Deb Bacon Ziegler in Lansing, Michigan. All they said was true. I wrecked my father's bank with my loans to dabble in wheat. But this was true. I was buying wheat for him as well, who couldn't margin the deal in his name because of his church relationship. And while George Reese was serving his term, I chased the will o' the wisp of women and the mockery of wine in New York. It's deathly to sicken of wine and women when nothing else is left in life. But suppose your head is gray, and bowed on a table covered with acrid stubs of cigarettes and empty glasses, and a knock is heard, and you know it's the knock so long drowned out by popping corks and the peacock screams of demi-reps, and you look up, and there's your theft who waited until your head was gray, and your heart skipped beats to say to you, The game is ended. 
I've called for you. Go out on Broadway and be run over. They'll ship you back to Spoon River. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mickey McGrew from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Joshua Young. Homepages.nyu.edu backslash tilde rjy201. It was just like everything else in life. Something outside myself drew me down. My own strength never failed me. Why, there was the time I earned the money with which to go away to school. And my father suddenly needed help, and I had to give him all of it. Just so it went till I ended up a man of all work in Spoon River. Thus, when I got the water tower cleaned, and they hauled me up the seventy feet, I unhooked the rope around my waist and laughingly flung my giant arms over the smooth steel lips of the top of the tower. But they slipped from the treacherous slime, and down, down, down I plunged into bellowing darkness. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Rosie Roberts from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Chris the Girl. I was sick, but more than that, I was mad at the crooked police and the crooked game of life. So I wrote to the chief of police in Peoria. I am here in my girlhood home in Spoon River, gradually wasting away. But come and take me. I killed the son of the merchant prince in Madame Lou's, and the papers that said he killed himself in his home while cleaning a hunting gun lied like the devil to hush up scandal for the bribe of advertising. In my room I shot him at Madame Lou's, because he knocked me down when I said that, in spite of all the money he had, I'd see my lover that night. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Oscar Hummel from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas September twenty third, two 2006 I staggered on through darkness. There was a hazy sky, a few stars which I followed as best I could. It was nine o'clock. I was trying to get home. But somehow I was lost, though really keeping the road. Then I reeled through a gate and into a yard, and called at the top of my voice, Oh, Fiddler! Oh, Mr. Jones! I thought it was his house, and he would show me the way home. But who should step out but A.D. Blood, in his nightshirt, waving a stick of wood, and roaring about the cursed saloons and the criminals they made? You drunken Oscar Hummel, he said as I stood there weaving to and fro, taking the blows from the stick in his hand, till I dropped down dead at his feet. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Roscoe Percopoli by Edgar Lee Masters from Spoon River Anthology She loved me, oh, how she loved me. I never had a chance to escape from the day she first saw me. But then, after we were married, I thought she might prove her mortality and let me out, or she might divorce me. But few die, none resign. Then I ran away and was gone a year on a lark, but she never complained. She said all would be well, that I would return, and I did return. I told her that while taking a row in a boat I had been captured near Van Buren Street by pirates on Lake Michigan and kept in chains so I could not write her. She cried and kissed me and said it was cruel, outrageous, inhuman, I then concluded our marriage was a divine dispensation and could not be dissolved except by death. I was right. 
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mrs. Perkapile from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Kristen Luoma. GreenKRI.com he ran away and was gone for a year. When he came home, he told me the silly story of being kidnapped by pirates on Lake Michigan, and kept in chains so he could not write me. I pretended to believe it, though I knew very well what he was doing, and that he met the milliner, Mrs. Williams, now and then, when she went to the city to buy goods, as she said. But a promise is a promise, and marriage is marriage, and out of respect for my own character, I refused to be drawn into a divorce, by the scheme of a husband who had merely grown tired of his marital vow and duty. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Josiah Tompkins From the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Recorded for LibriVox.org by Ralph Clapis, October 22, 2006, Valparaiso, Indiana. I was well known and much beloved, and rich, as fortunes were reckoned in Spoon River, where I had lived and worked. That was the home for me, though all my children had flown afar, which is the way of nature, all but one. The boy, who was the baby, stayed at home, to be my help in my failing years, and the solace of his mother. But I grew weaker, as he grew stronger, and he quarreled with me about the business, and his wife said I was a hindrance to it, and he won his mother to see as he did, till they tore me up to be transplanted with them to her girlhood home in Missouri. And so much of my fortune was gone at last, though I made the will just as he drew it, he profited little by it. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mrs. Kessler from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Caitlin Sticko. 2006. Mr. Kessler, you know, was in the army, and he drew six dollars a month as a pension, and stood on the corner talking politics, or sat at home reading Grant's memoirs. And I supported the family by washing, learning the secrets of all the people from their curtains, counterpanes, shirts, and skirts, for things that are new grow old at length, they're replaced with better or none at all. People are prospering or falling back. And rents and patches widen with time. No thread or needle can pace decay. And there are stains that baffle soap. And there are colors that run in spite of you, blamed though you are for spoiling a dress. Handkerchiefs. Napery have their secrets. The laundress life knows all about it. And I, who went to all the funerals held in Spoon River, swear I never saw a dead face without thinking it looked like something washed and ironed. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Harmon Whitney from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas September 25, 2006 Out of the lights and roar of cities Drifting down like a spark in Spoon River Burnt out with the fire of drink and broken The paramour of a woman I took in self-contempt but to hide a wounded pride as well, to be judged and loathed by a village of little minds, 
I, gifted with tongues and wisdom, sunk here to the dust of the justice court, a picker of rags and the rubbage of spites and wrongs. I, whom fortune smiled on, I in a village spouting to gaping yokels pages of verse out of the lore of golden years, or raising a laugh with a flash of filthy wit when they bought the drinks to kindle my dying mind. To be judged by you, the soul of me hidden from you, with its wound gangrened by a love for a wife who made the wound, with her cold white bosom, treasonous, pure and hard, relentless to the last, when the touch of her hand at any time might have cured me of the typhus, caught in the jungle of life where many are lost. And only to think that my soul could not react, like Byron's did, in song, in something noble, but turned on itself like a tortured snake. Judge me this way, O world. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Bert Kessler from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Matthew Walton I winged my bird, though he flew toward the setting sun, but just as the shot rang out he soared up and up through the splinters of golden light, till he turned right over, feathers ruffled, with some of the down of him floating near, and fell like a plummet into the grass. I tramped about, parting the tangles, till I saw a splash of blood on a stump, and the quail lying close to the rotten roots. I reached my hand, but saw no briar, but something pricked and stung, and numbed it. And then in a second I spied the rattler, the shutters wide in his yellow eyes, the head of him arched, sunk back in the rings of him. A circle of filth, the colour of ashes, or oak leaves bleached under layers of leaves. I stood like a stone as he shrank and uncoiled, and started to crawl beneath the stump, when I fell limp in the grass. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lambert Hutchins from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas October 16th, 2006 I have two monuments besides this granite obelisk. One, the house I built on the hill, with its spires, bay windows, and roof of slate. The other, the lakefront in Chicago where the railroad keeps a switching yard, with whistling engines and crunching wheels and smoke and soot thrown over the city and the crash of cars along the boulevard, a blot like a hog pen on the harbor of a great metropolis, foul as a sty. I help to give this heritage to generations yet unborn with my vote in the House of Representatives and the lure of the thing was to be at rest from the never-ending fright of need, and to give my daughters gentle breeding and a sense of security in life. But, you see, though I had the mansion house and traveling passes and local distinction, I could hear the whispers, 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 wherever I went and my daughters grew up with a look as if someone were about to strike them, and they married madly, helter-skelter, just to get out and have a change. And what was the whole of the business worth? Why, it wasn't worth a damn. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lillian Stewart from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Calliope I was the daughter of Lambert Hutchins, born in a cottage near the grist mill, reared in the mansion there on the hill, with its spires, bay windows, and roof of slate. How proud my mother was of the mansion! 
How proud of fathers rise in the world, and how my father loved and watched us, and guarded our happiness. But I believe the house was a curse, for father's fortune was little beside it, and when my husband found he had married a girl who was really poor, he taunted me with the spires, and called the house a fraud on the world, a treacherous lure to young men, raising hopes of a dowry not to be had and a man while selling his vote should get enough from the people's betrayal to wall the whole of his family in he vexed my life till i went back home and lived like an old maid till i died keeping house for father end of poem this recording is in the public domain hortense robbins from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Joyce Nussbaum, Highland Park, New Jersey. My name used to be in the papers daily, as having dined somewhere, or traveled somewhere, or rented a house in Paris, where I entertained the nobility. I was forever eating or traveling, or taking the cure at Baden-Baden. Now I am here to do honor to Spoon River, here beside the family whence I sprang. No one cares now where I dined, or lived, or whom I entertained, or how often I took the cure at Baden-Baden. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Batterton Dobbins from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Greg Ahi, November 13th, 2006 in Anchorage, Alaska. Did my widow flit about from Mackinac to Los Angeles, resting and bathing and sitting an hour or more at the table over soups and meats and delicate sweets and coffee? I was cut down in my prime from overwork and anxiety, but I thought all along, whatever happens, I've kept my insurance up, and there's something in the bank in a section of land in Manitoba. But just as I slipped, I had a vision in a last delirium. I saw myself lying nailed in a box with a white lawn tie and a boutonniere, and my wife was sitting by a window someplace afar, overlooking the sea. She seemed so rested, ruddy, and fat, although her hair was white, and she smiled and said to a colored waiter, Another slice of roast beef, George. Here's a nickel for your trouble. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Jacob Godby from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas. September 3, 2006. How did you feel, you libertarians, who spent your talents rallying noble reasons around the saloon? as if liberty was not to be found anywhere except at the bar or at a table, guzzling? How did you feel, Ben Pantier, and the rest of you, who almost stoned me for a tyrant, garbed as a moralist and as a wry-faced ascetic, frowning upon Yorkshire pudding, roast beef and ale, and good will and rosy cheer, things you never saw in a grog shop in your life? How did you feel after I was dead and gone, and your goddess, Liberty, unmasked as a strumpet, selling out the streets of Spoon River to the insolent giants who manned the saloons from afar? Did it occur to you that personal liberty is liberty of the mind rather than of the belly? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Walter Simmons, from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Leah Brotman. My parents thought that I would be as great as Edison, or greater. For as a boy I made balloons, and wondrous kites, and toys with clocks, and little engines with tracks to run on, and telephones of cans and thread. I played the cornet and painted pictures, modeled in clay, and took the part of the villain in Octoroon. But then, at twenty-one I married, and had to live. And so, to live, I learned the trade of making watches, and kept the jewelry store on the square. 
Thinking, 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 not of business but of the engine I studied the calculus to build. And all Spoon River watched and waited to see it work. But it never worked. And a few kind souls believed my genius was somehow hampered by the store. It wasn't true. The truth was this. I didn't have the brains. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Tom Beatty from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas, October 17, 2006 I was a lawyer like Harmon Whitney or Kinsey Keene or Garrison Standard, for I tried the rights of property, although by lamplight, for thirty years in that poker room in the opera house, and I say to you that life's a gambler head and shoulders above us all. No mayor alive can close the house, and if you lose, you can squeal as you will. You'll not get back your money. He makes the percentage hard to conquer. He stacks the cards to catch your weakness and not to meet your strength. And he gives you seventy years to play, for if you cannot win in seventy, you cannot win at all. So, if you lose, get out of the room. Get out of the room when your time is up. It's mean to sit and fumble the cards and curse your losses, leaden-eyed, whining to try and try. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Roy Butler from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by David Barnes If the learned Supreme Court of Illinois got at the secret of every case as well as it does a case of rape, it would be the greatest court in the world. A jury of neighbours mostly, with Butch Weldy as foreman, found me guilty in ten minutes and two ballots on a case like this. Richard Bandle and I had trouble over a fence, and my wife and Mrs. Bandle quarrelled as to whether Ipava was a finer town than Table Grove. I awoke one morning with the love of God brimming over my heart, so I went to see Richard to settle the fence in the spirit of Jesus Christ. I knocked on the door, and his wife opened. She smiled and asked me in. I entered. She slammed the door and began to scream, Take your hands off, you low-down varlet! Just then her husband entered. I waved my hands, choked up with words. He went for his gun, and I ran out. But neither the Supreme Court nor my wife believed a word she said. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Number 149 Circe Foot from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Sean McGahey. December 29th, 2006. I wanted to go away to college, but Rich Aunt Persis wouldn't help me. So I made gardens and raked the lawns, and bought John Alden's books with my earnings, and toiled for the very means of life. I wanted to marry Delia Prickett. But how could I do that with what I earned? And there was Aunt Persis, more than seventy, who sat in a wheelchair half alive, with her throat so paralyzed when she swallowed, the soup ran out of her mouth like a duck. A gourmand yet, investing her income in mortgages, fretting all the time about her notes and rents and papers. That day I was sawing wood for her, and reading Proudhon in between. I went into the house for a drink of water, and there she sat, asleep in her chair, and Proud Hun lying on the table, and a bottle of chloroform on the book she used sometimes for an aching tooth. I poured the chloroform on a handkerchief, 
and held it to her nose till she died. Oh, Delia, Delia, you and Proud Hun steadied my hand, and the coroner said she died of heart failure. I married Delia and got the money. A joke on you, Spoon River? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Edmund Pollard From Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Aaron Decker I would I had thrust my hands of flesh into the disc flowers, be infested, into the mirror-like core of fire of the light of life, the sun of delight. For what are anthers worth? or petals, or halo-rays, mockeries, shadows of the heart of the flower, the central flame. All is yours, young passer-by. Enter the banquet room with the thought. Don't sidle in as if you were doubtful whether you're welcome. The feast is yours. Nor take but a little, refusing more with a bashful thank you when you're hungry. Is your soul alive? Then let it feed. Leave no balconies where you can climb, nor milk-white bosoms where you can rest, nor golden heads with pillows to share, nor wine cups while the wine is sweet, nor ecstasies of body or soul. You will die, no doubt, but die while living in depths of azure, wrapped and mated, kissing the queen bee, life. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Thomas Trevelyan from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas September 14, 2006 Reading in Ovid the sorrowful story of Idas, son of the love of Tyrius and Procne, slain for the guilty passion of Tyrius for Philomela, the flesh of him served to Tyrius by Procne, and the wrath of Tyrius, the murderess pursuing till the gods made Philomela a nightingale, lute of the rising moon, and Procne a swallow. O oh, livers and artists of Hellas, centuries gone, sealing in little thuribles dreams and wisdom, Incense beyond all price, for ever fragrant, A breath whereof makes clear the eyes of the soul. How I inhaled its sweetness here in Spoon River, The thurible opening when I had lived and learned How all of us kill the children of love, And all of us, knowing not what we do, Devour their flesh. And all of us change to singers, although it be but once in our lives, or change, alas, to swallows, to twitter amid cold winds and falling leaves. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Percival Sharp from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Greg Ahi January 1st, 2007, in Anchorage, Alaska. Observe the clasped hands. Are they hands of farewell or greeting? Hands that I helped or hands that helped me? Would it not be well to carve a hand with an inverted thumb like Elagabalus? And yonder is a broken chain, the weakest link idea perhaps. But what was it? and lambs, some lying down, others standing as if listening to the shepherd, others bearing a cross, one foot lifted up. Why not chisel a few shambles and fallen columns? Carp the pedestal, please, or the foundations. Let us see the cause of the fall. And compasses and mathematical instruments in irony of the under-tenant's ignorance of determinants and the calculus of variations. And anchors for those who never sailed. And gates ajar, Yes, so they were. You left them open, and stray goats entered your garden. And an eye, watching like one of the airy mosby. So did you, with one eye. 
and angels blowing trumpets. You are heralded. It is your horn and your angel and your family's estimate. It is all very well, but for myself I know I stirred certain vibrations in Spoon River, which are my true epitaph, more lasting than stone. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Hiram Skates From the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Liu I tried to win the nomination for president of the county board, and I made speeches all over the county, denouncing Solomon Purple, my rival, as an enemy of the people, in league with the master foes of man. Young idealists, broken warriors, hobbling on one crutch of hope, souls that stake their all on the truth, losers of worlds at heaven's bidding, flocked about me and followed my voice as the savior of the county. But Solomon won the nomination, and then I faced about and rallied my followers to his standard, made him victor, made him king of the golden mountain with a door which closed on my heels just as I entered, flattered by Solomon's invitation to be the county board secretary. And out in the cold stood all my followers, young idealists, broken warriors, hobbling on one crutch of hope, souls that staked their all on the truth, losers of worlds at heaven's bidding, watching the devil kick the millennium over the golden mountain. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Peleg Pogue from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas. September 26, 2006. Horses and men are just alike. It was my stallion, Billy Lee, black as a cat and trim as a deer, with an eye of fire, keen to start, and he could hit the fastest speed of any racer around Spoon River. But just as you'd think he couldn't lose, with his lead of fifty yards or more, he'd rear himself and throw the rider, and fall back over, tangled up, completely gone to pieces. You see, he was a perfect fraud. He couldn't win. He couldn't work, he was too light to haul or plow with, and no one wanted colts from him. And when I tried to drive him, well, he ran away and killed me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Number 155, Jeduthan Hawley, from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Frank Farash There would be a knock at the door, and I would arise at midnight and go to the shop, where belated travelers would hear me hammering sepulchral boards and tacking satin. And often I wondered who would go with me to the distant land, our names the theme for talk, in the same week, for I've observed two always go together. Chase Henry was paired with Edith Conant, and Jonathan Somers with Willie Metcalf, and Editor Hamblin with Francis Turner, when he prayed to live longer than Editor Whedon, and Thomas Rhodes with Widow McFarlane, and Emily Sparks with Barry Holden, and Oscar Hummel with Davis Matlock and Editor Whedon with Fiddler Jones, and Faith Matheny with Dorcas Gustine. And I, the solemnest man in town, stepped off with Daisy Fraser. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Abel Milvaney from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas, October 26, 2006. I bought every kind of machine that's known, 
grinders, shellers, planters, mowers, mills and rakes and plows and threshers, and all of them stood in the rain and sun, getting rusted, warped, and battered, for I had no sheds to store them in, and no use for most of them. And toward the last, when I thought it over, there by my window, growing clearer about myself as my pulse slowed down, and looked at one of the mills I bought, which I didn't have the slightest need of as things turned out, and I never ran. A fine machine, once brightly varnished, and eager to do its work, now with its paint washed off, I saw myself as a good machine that life had never used. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Oaks Tut from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Leo Brotman My mother was for women's rights, and my father was the rich miller at London Mills. I dreamed of the wrongs in the world and wanted to right them. When my father died, I set out to see peoples and countries in order to learn how to reform the world. I traveled through many lands, I saw the ruins of Rome, and the ruins of Athens, and the ruins of Thebes. And I sat by moonlight amid the necropolis of Memphis. There I was caught up by wings of flame, and a voice from heaven said to me, Injustice! Untruth destroyed them! Go forth! Preach justice! Preach truth! And I hastened back to Spoon River to say farewell to my mother before beginning my work. They all saw a strange light in my eye, and by and by, when I talked, they discovered what had come in my mind. Then, Jonathan Swift Summers challenged me to debate. The subject, I taking the negative, Pontius Pilate, the greatest philosopher of the world. And he won the debate by saying at last, Before you reform the world, Mr. Tut, Please answer the question of Pontius Pilate. What is truth? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Elliot Hawkins from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas September 7, 2006 I looked like Abraham Lincoln. I was one of you, Spoon River, in all fellowship, but standing for the rights of property and for order, a regular church attendant, sometimes appearing in your town meetings to warn you against the evils of discontent and envy and to denounce those who try to destroy the Union and to point to the peril of the Knights of Labor. My success and my example are inevitable influences in your young men and in generations to come. In spite of attacks of newspapers like the Clarion, a regular visitor at Springfield, when the legislature was in session, to prevent raids upon the railroads and the men building up the state. Trusted by them and by you, Spoon River, equally, in spite of the whispers that I was a lobbyist. Moving quietly through the world, rich and courted, dying at last, of course, but lying here under a stone with an open book carved upon it and the words, Of such is the kingdom of heaven. And now, you world-savers, who reaped nothing in life and in death, have neither stones nor epitaphs, how do you like your silence from mouths stopped with the dust of my triumphant career? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Voltaire Johnson From the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Liu Why did you bruise me with your rough places If you did not want me to tell you about them And stifle me with your stupidities If you did not want me to expose them 
and nail me with the nails of cruelty, if you did not want me to pluck the nails forth and fling them in your faces, and starve me, because I refused to obey you, if you did not want me to undermine your tyranny. Might have been as soul serene as William Wordsworth except for you. But what a coward you are, Spoon River when you drove me to stand in a magic circle by the sword of truth described, and then to whine and curse your burns and curse my power who stood and laughed amid ironical lightning. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. English Thornton from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas October 27, 2006 Hear, you sons of the men who fought with Washington at Valley Forge and whipped Black Hawk at Starved Rock. Arise! Do battle with the descendants of those who bought land in the loop when it was waste sand and sold blankets and guns to the army of Grant, and sat in legislatures in the early days taking bribes from the railroads. Arise! Do battle with the fops and bluffs, the pretenders and figurants of the society column, and the yokel souls whose daughters marry counts, and the parasites on great ideas, and the noisy riders of great causes, and the heirs of ancient thefts. Arise, and make the city yours, and the state yours, you who are the sons of the hardy yeomanry of the forties. By God, if you do not destroy these vermin, my avenging ghost will wipe out your city and your state. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Enoch Dunlap from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Maddie How many times during the twenty years I was your leader, friends of Spoon River, did you neglect the convention and caucus, and leave the burden on my hands, of guarding and saving the people's cause, sometimes because you were ill, or your grandmother was ill, or you drank too much and fell asleep, or else you said, He is our leader, all will be well, he fights for us. We have nothing to do but follow. But oh, how you cursed me when I fell, and cursed me, saying I had betrayed you, in leaving the caucus room for a moment, when the people's enemies there assembled, waited and watched for a chance to destroy the sacred rights of the people. You common rabble, I left the caucus to go to the urinal. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ida Fricky from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Annie Coleman. Nothing in life is alien to you. I was a penniless girl from Summum who stepped from the morning train in Spoon River. All the houses stood before me with closed doors and drawn shades. I was barred out. I had no place or part in any of them. And I walked past the old McNeely mansion, a castle of stone, mid walks and gardens, with workmen about the place on guard, and the county and state upholding it for its lordly owner, full of pride. I was so hungry I had a vision. I saw a giant pair of scissors dip from the sky like the beam of a dredge, and cut the house in two like a curtain. But at the commercial I saw a man, who winked at me as I asked for work. It was Wash McNeely's son— he proved the link in the chain of title to half my ownership of the mansion, through a breach of promise suit, the scissors. So, you see, the house, from the day I was born, 
was only waiting for me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Seth Compton From Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Aaron Decker When I died, the circulating library which I built up for Spoon River and managed for the good of inquiring minds was sold at auction on the public square as if to destroy the last vestige of my memory and influence. For those of you who could not see the virtue of knowing Volney's ruins as well as Butler's analogy, and Faust as well as Evangeline, were really the power in the village. And often you asked me, what is the use of knowing the evil in the world? I am out of your way now, Spoon River. Choose your own good and call it good, for I could never make you see that no one knows what is good who knows not what is evil, and no one knows what is true who knows not what is false. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Felix Schmidt from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Betsy Bush Marquette, Michigan, June 2006 It was only a little house of two rooms, almost like a child's playhouse, with scarce five acres of ground around it, and I had so many children to feed, and school and clothe, and a wife who was sick from bearing children. One day, lawyer Whitney came along, and proved to me that Christian Dahlman, who owned three thousand acres of land, had bought the eighty that adjoined me in 1871 for eleven dollars at a sale for taxes, while my father lay in his mortal illness. So the quarrel arose, and I went to law. And when we came to the proof, a survey of the land showed clear as day that Dalman's tax deed covered my ground and my little house of two rooms. It served me right for stirring him up. I lost my case and lost my place. I left the courtroom and went to work as Christian Dalman's tenant. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Schroeder the Fisherman from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas October 28, 2006 I sat on the bank above Bernadotte and dropped crumbs in the water just to see the minnows bump each other until the strongest got the prize. Or I went to my little pasture where the peaceful swine were asleep in the wallow, or nosing each other lovingly, and emptied a basket of yellow corn, and watched them push and squeal and bite and trample each other to get the corn. And I saw how Christian Dalman's farm, of more than three thousand acres, swallowed the patch of Felix Schmidt, as a bass will swallow a minnow. And I say, if there's anything in man, spirit or conscience or breath of God, that makes him different from fishes or hogs, I'd like to see it work. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Richard Bone from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Joshua Young, homepages.nyu.edu, backslash tilde, rjy201. When I first came to Spoon River, I did not know whether what they told me was true or false. They would bring me the epitaph and stand around the shop while it worked and say, He was so kind. 
He was wonderful. She was the sweetest woman. He was a consistent Christian. And I chiseled for them whatever they wished, all in ignorance of its truth. But later, as I lived among the people here, I knew how near to the life were the epitaphs that were ordered for them as they died. But still I chiseled whatever they paid me to chisel, and made myself party to the false chronicles of the stones, even as the historian does, who writes without knowing the truth, or because he is influenced to hide it. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Silas Dement from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters, read for LibriVox.org by Greg Ahi, November 13th, 2006, in Anchorage, Alaska. It was moonlight, and the earth sparkled with new fallen frost. It was midnight, and not a soul was abroad. Out of the chimney of the courthouse a greyhound of smoke leapt and chased the northwest wind. I carried a ladder to the landing of the stairs and leaned it against the frame of the trap door in the ceiling of the portico, and I crawled under the roof and amid the rafters and flung among the seasoned timbers a lighted handful of oil-soaked waste. Then I came down and slunk away. In a little while the fire bell rang. Clang, 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 and the Spoon River Ladder Company came with a dozen buckets and began to pour water on the glorious bonfire, growing hotter, higher, and brighter till the walls fell in, and the limestone columns where Lincoln stood crash like trees when the woodman fells them. When I came back from Juliet, there was a new courthouse with a dome, for I was punished like all who destroy the past for the sake of the future. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Poem 168, Dillard Sisman, from the Spoon River Anthology, by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org, by Linda Liu. The buzzards wheel slowly in wide circles in a sky, faintly hazed as from dust from the road, and a wind sweeps through the pasture where I lie, beating the grass into long waves. My kite is above the wind, though now and then it wobbles, like a man shaking his shoulders, and the tail streams out momentarily, then sinks to rest, and the buzzards wheel and wheel, sweeping the zenith with wide circles above my kite, and the hills sleep and a farmhouse, white as snow, peeps from green trees far away, and I watch my kite, for the thin moon will kindle herself ere long, then she will swing like a pendulum dial to the tail of my kite, a spurt of flame like a water dragon dazzles my eyes, I am shaken as a banner. And a poem. This recording is in the public domain. Jonathan Houghton from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas. September 27, 2006. There is the caw of a crow, and the hesitant song of a thrush. There is the tinkle of a cowbell far away, and the voice of a plowman on Shipley's hill. The forest beyond the orchard is still with midsummer stillness, and along the road a wagon chuckles, loaded with corn, going to Atterbury, and an old man sits under a tree asleep. And an old woman crosses the road, coming from the orchard with a bucket of blackberries. And a boy lies in the grass near the feet of the old man, and looks up at the sailing clouds, and longs, and longs, and longs for what he knows not, for manhood, for life, for the unknown world. Then thirty years passed, and the boy returned, worn out by life and found the orchard vanished and the forest gone, 
and the house made over, and the roadway filled with dust from automobiles, and himself desiring the hill. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Poem 170 E.C. Culbertson From the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Liu Is it true, Spoon River, that in the hallway of the new courthouse there is a tablet of bronze containing the embossed faces of Editor Whedon and Thomas Rhodes? And is it true that my successful labors in the county board without which not one stone would have been placed on another, and the contributions out of my own pocket to build the temple are but memories among the people, gradually fading away, and soon to descend with them to this oblivion where I lie. In truth, I can so believe, for it is a law of the kingdom of heaven that whoso enters a vineyard at the eleventh hour shall receive a full day's pay. And it is a law of the kingdom of this world that those who first oppose a good work seize it and make it their own when the cornerstone is laid and memorial tablets are erected. End of poem. This poem is in the public domain. Number 171, Shack Die, from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by me, Glenn Hallstrom, a.k.a. Smokestack Jones. Smokestackjones at gmail.com. My blog is at toomuchjohnson.blogspot.com. The white men played all sorts of jokes on me. They took big fish off my hook and put little ones on while I was away, getting a stringer and made me believe I hadn't seen a right to fish I'd caught. When Burr Robin's circus came to town, they got the ringmaster to let a tame leopard into the ring and made me believe I was whipping a wild beast like Samson. When I, for an offer of fifty dollars, dragged him out to his cage, one time I entered my blacksmith shop and shook as I saw some horseshoes crawling across the floor as if alive. Walter Simons had put a magnet under the barrel of water. Every one of you, you white men, was fooled about fish and about leopards, too. And you didn't know any more than the horseshoes did what moved you about Spoon River. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Hildrip Tubbs from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas, October 18, 2006 I made two fights for the people. First, I left my party, bearing the gonfalon of independence, for reform, and was defeated. Next, I used my rebel strength to capture the standard of my old party, and I captured it. But I was defeated. Discredited and discarded, misanthropical, I turned to the solace of gold, and I used my remnant of power to fasten myself like a saprophyte upon the putrescent carcass of Thomas Rhodes' bankrupt bank, as a signee of the fund. Everyone now turned from me. My hair grew white, my purple lusts grew gray, Tobacco and whiskey lost their savor, and for years death ignored me as he does a hog. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Henry Tripp from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Leah Bratman the bank broke and I lost my savings. I was sick of the tiresome game in Spoon River, and I made up my mind to run away and leave my place in life and my family. 
but just as the midnight train pulled in, quick off the steps jumped Coley Green and Martin Weiss and began to fight to settle their ancient rivalry. Striking each other with fists that sounded like the blows of knotted clubs. Now, it seemed to me that Coley was winning when his bloody face broke into a grin of sickly cowardice, leaning on Martin and whining out, We're good friends, Mart. You know that I'm your friend. But a terrible punch from Martin knocked him around and around and into a heap. And then they arrested me as a witness. And I lost my train and stayed in Spoon River to wage my battle of life to the end. Oh, Cully Green, you were my savior. You, so ashamed and drooped for years, loitering listless about the streets and trying rags round your festering soul who failed to fight it out. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Poem 174, Granville Calhoun, from the Spoon River Anthology, by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org, by Frank Farage. I wanted to be county judge one more term, so as to round out a service of thirty years. But my friends left me and joined my enemies, and they elected a new man. Then a spirit of revenge seized me, and I infected my four sons with it, and I brooded upon retaliation until the great physician nature smote me through with paralysis to give my soul and body a rest. Did my sons get power and money? Did they serve the people or yoke them to till and harvest fields of self? For how could they ever forget my face at my bedroom window? sitting helpless amid my golden cages of singing canaries, looking at the old courthouse. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Henry C. Calhoun from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas September 28, 2006 I reached the highest place in Spoon River, but through what bitterness of spirit! The face of my father, sitting speechless, childlike, watching his canaries, and looking at the courthouse window of the county judge's room, and his admonitions to me to seek my own in life and punish Spoon River to avenge the wrong the people did him, filled me with furious energy to seek for wealth and seek for power. But what did he do but send me along the path that leads to the grove of the Furies? I followed the path, and I tell you this, on the way to the grove you'll pass the fates, shadow-eyed, bent over their weaving, stop for a moment, and if you see the thread of revenge leap out of the shuttle, then quickly snatch from Atropos the shears and cut it, lest your sons and the children of them and their children wear the envenomed robe. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Alfred Moore from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Samantha Hayes Why was I not devoured by self-contempt and rotted down by indifference and impotent revolt like Indignation Jones? Why, with all my errant steps, did I miss the fate of Willard Fluke? And why, though I stood at Bertrand's bar as a sort of decoy for the house to the boys to buy the drinks, did the curse of drink fall on me like rain that runs off, leaving the soul of me dry and clean? And why did I never kill a man like Jack McGuire? But instead I mounted a little in life, and I owe it all to a book I read. 
But why did I go to Mason City, where I chanced to see the book in a window, with its garnished cover luring my eye? And why did my soul respond to the book as I read it over and over? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Perry Zoll from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Leah Bratman. My thanks, friends of the County Scientific Association, for this modest boulder and its little tablet of bronze. Twice I tried to join your honored body and was rejected. And when my little brochure on the intelligence of plants began to attract attention, you almost voted me in. After that, I grew beyond the need of you and your recognition. Yet, I do not reject your memorial stone, seeing that I should, in so doing, deprive you of honor to yourselves. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Dippold the Optician from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas, October twenty ninth, 2006 What do you see now? Globes of red, yellow, purple. Just a moment. And now? My father and mother and sisters. Yes. And now? Knights at arms, beautiful women, kind faces. Try this. A field of grain, a city. Very good. And now? A young woman with angels bending over her. A heavier lens. And now? Many women with bright eyes and open lips. Try this. Just a goblet on a table. Oh, I see. Try this lens. Just an open space. I see nothing in particular. Well, now? Pine trees, a lake, a summer sky. That's better. And now? A book. Read a page for me. I can't. My eyes are carried beyond the page. Try this lens. Depths of air. Excellent. And now? Light. Just light, making everything below it a toy world. Very well. We'll make the glasses accordingly. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. McGrady Graham from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake. In Long Branch, New Jersey, on July 21, 2006. PaintedRiceCakes.org Tell me, was Aldridge elected governor? For when the returns began to come in and Cleveland was sweeping the east, it was too much for you, poor old heart, who had striven for democracy in the long, long years of defeat. And like a watch that is worn, I felt you growing slower until you stopped. Tell me, was Altgelt elected, and what did he do? Did they bring his head on a platter to a dancer, or did he triumph for the people? For when I saw him and took his hand, the childlike blueness of his eyes moved me to tears. And there was an air of eternity about him, like the cold, clear light that rests at dawn on the hills. End of poem. 
This recording is in the public domain. Poem 180, Archibald Higby, from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters, read for LibriVox.org by Linda Liu. I loathed you, Spoon River. I tried to rise above you. I was ashamed of you. I despised you as a place of my nativity. And there in Rome, among the artists, speaking Italian, speaking French, I seemed to myself at times to be free of every trace of my origin. I seemed to be reaching the heights of art, and to breathe the air that the masters breathe, and to see the world with their eyes. But still they'd pass my work and say, What are you driving at, my friend? Sometimes a face looks like Apollo's, at others it has a trace of Lincoln's. There was no culture, you know, in Spoon River. And I burned with shame and held my peace. And what could I do, all covered over and weighed down with western soil, except aspire and pray for another birth in the world, with all of Spoon River rooted out of my soul? And a poem. This recording is in the public domain. Tom Merritt from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Hoover. At first I suspected something. She acted so calm and absent minded. And one day I heard the back door shut as I entered the front and I saw him slink back of the smokehouse into the lot and run across the field. And I meant to kill him on sight. But that day, walking near Fourth Bridge, without a stick or a stone at hand, all of a sudden I saw him standing, scared to death, holding his rabbits. And all I could say was, Don't, 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 as he aimed and fired at my heart. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mrs. Merritt, from the Spoon River Anthology, by Edgar Lee Masters, read for LibriVox.org by Corrie Samuel. Silent before the jury, returning no word to the judge when he asked me if I had out to say against the sentence, only shaking my head. What could I say to people who thought that a woman of thirty-five was at fault when her lover of nineteen killed her husband? even though she had said to him over and over, Go away, Elmer, go far away. I have maddened your brain with the gift of my body. You will do some terrible thing. And just as I feared, he killed my husband, with which I had nothing to do before God. Silent for thirty years in prison, and the iron gates of Joliet swung as the grey and silent trustees carried me out in a coffin. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Elmer Carr from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Greg Ahi, November 13, 2006, in Anchorage, Alaska. What but the love of God could have softened and made forgiving the people of Spoon River toward me, who wronged the bed of Thomas Merritt and murdered him beside? O oh, loving hearts that took me in again when I returned from fourteen years in prison! O oh, helping hands that in the church received me and heard with tears my penitent confession, who took the sacrament of bread and wine! Repent, ye living ones, and rest with Jesus! End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Elizabeth Childers from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Maddie Dust of my dust, and dust with my dust O child who died as you entered the world, dead with my death Not knowing breath, though you tried so hard with a heart that beat when you lived with me and stopped when you left me for life. It is well, my child, 
for you never traveled the long, long way that begins with school days, when little fingers blur under the tears that fall on the crooked letters, and the earliest wound when a little mate leaves you alone for another, and sickness, and the face of fear by the bed, the death of a father or mother, or shame for them, or poverty, the maiden sorrow of school days ended, and eyeless nature that makes you drink from the cup of love, though you know it is poisoned. To whom would your flower face have been lifted? Botanist? Weakling? Cry of what blood to yours? Pure or foul, for it makes no matter. It is blood that calls to our blood. And then your children, oh, what might they be? And what your sorrow? Child, child, death is better than life. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Edith Conant from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters We stand about this place, we, the memories, and shade our eyes because we dread to read. June seventeenth, 1884, aged twenty-one years and three days. And all things are changed. And we, we the memories, stand here for ourselves alone, for no eye marks us, or we would know why we are here. Your husband is dead, your sister lives far away, your father is bent with age. He has forgotten you, he scarcely leaves the house any more. No one remembers your exquisite face, your lyric voice, how you sang, even on the morning you were stricken, with piercing sweetness, with thrilling sorrow, before the advent of the child which died with you. It is all forgotten, save by us, the memories, who are forgotten by the world. All is changed, save the river and the hill. Even they are changed. Only the burning sun and the quiet stars are the same. And we, we the memories, stand here in awe, our eyes closed with the weariness of tears, in immeasurable weariness. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Poem 186, Charles Webster, from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Liu. The pine woods on the hill and the farmhouse miles away showed clear as though behind a lens under a sky of peacock blue. But a blanket of cloud by afternoon muffled the earth, and you walked the road and the clover field where the only sound was a cricket's liquid tremolo. Then the sun went down between great drifts of distant storms, for a rising wind swept clean the sky and blew the flames of the unprotected stars and swayed the russet moon hanging between the rim of the hill and the twinkling boughs of the apple orchard. You walked the shore and thought, where the throats of the waves were like whippoorwills, singing beneath the water and crying to the wash of the wind in the cedar trees, till you stood too full for tears by the cot, and looking up, saw Jupiter dipping the spire of the giant pine, and looking down saw my vacant chair rocked by the wind on the lonely porch. Be brave, beloved. And the poem. This recording is in the public domain. Father Malloy from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas September 8, 2006 You are over there, Father Malloy, where holy ground is, and the cross marks every grave. Not with us here on the hill, 
us of wavering faith and clouded vision and drifting hope and unforgiven sins. You were so human, Father Malloy, taking a friendly glass sometimes with us, siding with us who would rescue Spoon River from the coldness and dreariness of village morality. You were like a traveler who brings a little box of sand from the wastes about the pyramids and makes them real, and Egypt real. You were a part of and related to a great past, and yet you were so close to many of us. You believed in the joy of life. You did not seem to be ashamed of the flesh. You faced life as it is and as it changes. Some of us almost came to you, Father Molloy, seeing how your church had divined the heart and provided for it through Peter the Flame, Peter the Rock. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Amy Green From Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Elizabeth Palmer Not a youth with hoary head and haggard eye, but an old man with smooth skin and black hair. I had the face of a boy as long as I lived, and for years a soul that was stiff and bent, in a world which saw me just as a jest, to be hailed familiarly when it chose, and loaded up as a man when it chose being neither man nor boy. In truth, it was soul as well as body which never matured, and I say to you that the much-sought prize of eternal youth is just arrested growth. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Poem 189, Calvin Campbell, from the Spoon River Anthology, by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Frank Farage. Ye who are kicking against fate, tell me how it is that on this hillside, running down to the river, which fronts the sun and the south wind, this plant draws from the air and soil poison and becomes poison ivy. And this plant draws from the same air and soil sweet elixirs and colors and becomes arbutus. And both flourish you may blame Spoon River for what it is, but whom do you blame for the will in you that feeds itself and makes you duckweed, jimson, dandelion, or mullen, and which can never use any soil or air, so as to make you jessamine or wisteria? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Henry Layton, from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters, read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas, October 19, 2006. Whoever thou art who passest by, know that my father was gentle and my mother was violent. While I was born the whole of such hostile halves, not intermixed and fused, but each distinct, feebly soldered together. Some of you saw me as gentle, some as violent, some as both. But neither half of me wrought my ruin. It was the falling asunder of halves, never a part of each other, that left me a lifeless soul. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Harlan Sewell from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Greg Ahi, January 1st, 2007, in Anchorage, Alaska. You never understood, O oh unknown one, why it was I repaid your devoted friendship and delicate ministrations first with diminished thanks, afterward by gradually withdrawing my presence from you so that I might not be compelled to thank you, and then with silence which followed upon our final separation. You had cured my diseased soul 
but to cure it you saw my disease, you knew my secret, and that is why I fled from you. For though when our bodies rise from pain we kiss forever the watchful hands that gave us wormwood, while we shudder for thinking of the wormwood, a soul that's cured is a different matter. For there we'd blot from memory the soft toned words, the searching eyes, and stand forever oblivious, not so much of the sorrow itself as of the hand that healed it. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ippolit Konovalov from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters, read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas, September 29, 2006. I was a gunsmith in Odessa. One night the police broke in the room where a group of us were reading Spencer, and seized our books and arrested us. But I escaped and came to New York, and thence to Chicago, and then to Spoon River, where I could study my cot in peace and eke out a living repairing guns. Look at my molds, my architectonics, one for a barrel, one for a hammer, and others for the other parts of a gun. Well, now suppose no gunsmith living had anything else but duplicate molds of these I show you. Well, all guns would be just alike with a hammer to hit the cap and a barrel to carry the shot, all acting alike for themselves, and all acting against each other alike. And there would be your world of guns, which nothing could ever free from itself, except a molder with different molds, to mold the metal over. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Number 193, Henry Phipps, from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters, read for LibriVox.org by Sean McGahey, December 29, 2006. I was the Sunday school superintendent, the dummy president of the wagon works and the canning factory, acting for Thomas Rhodes and the banking clique. My son, the cashier of the bank, wedded to Rhodes' daughter. My weekdays spent in making money, my Sundays at church and in prayer, in everything a cog in the wheel of things as they are, of money, master, and man, made white with the paint of the Christian creed. And then the bank collapsed. I stood and looked at the wrecked machine, the wheels with blowholes stopped with putty and painted, the rotten bolts, the broken rods, and only the hopper for souls fit to be used again, in a new devourer of life, when newspapers, judges, and money magicians build over again. I was stripped to the bone, but I lay in the rock of ages, seeing now through the game no longer a dupe, and knowing the upright shall dwell in the land, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. Then suddenly Dr. Myers discovered a cancer in my liver, I was not, after all, the particular care of God. Why, even thus standing on a peak, above the mist through which I had climbed, and ready for larger life in the world, eternal forces moved me on with a push. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Harry Wilmans from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Anthony Crane I was just turned twenty-one, and Henry Phipps, the Sunday school superintendent, made a speech in Bindle's Opera House. The honor of the flag must be upheld, he said, whether it be assailed by a barbarous tribe of Tagalogs or the greatest power in Europe. And we cheered and cheered the speech and the flag he waved as he spoke, and I went to the war in spite of my father and followed the flag till I saw it raised by our camp in a rice field near Manila, and all of us cheered and cheered it. But there were flies and poisonous things, and there was the deadly water and the cruel heat and the sickening putrid food, and the smell of the trench just back of the tents where the soldiers went to empty themselves, and there were the whores who followed us full of syphilis, and beastly acts between ourselves or alone, with bullying, hatred, degradation among us, 
and days of loathing and nights of fear to the hour of the charge through the steaming swamp, following the flag, till I fell with a scream, shot through the guts. Now there's a flag over me in Spoon River. A flag. A flag. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. John Wasson from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas October 30, 2006 Oh, the dew-wet grass of the meadow in North Carolina, through which Rebecca followed me wailing, wailing, one child in her arms and three that ran along wailing, lengthening out the farewell to me off to the war with the British, and then the long, hard years down to the day of Yorktown, and then my search for Rebecca, finding her at last in Virginia, two children dead in the meanwhile. We went by oxen to Tennessee, thence, after years, to Illinois, at last to Spoon River. We cut the buffalo grass, we felled the forests, we built the schoolhouses, built the bridges, leveled the roads, and tilled the fields, alone with poverty, scourges, death. If Harry Wilmans, who fought the Filipinos, is to have a flag on his grave, take it from mine. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Poem 196 Many Soldiers From the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Frank Farage The idea danced before us as a flag, the sound of martial music, the thrill of carrying a gun, Advancement in the world on coming home. A glint of glory, wrath for foes. A dream of duty to country or to God. But these were things in ourselves shining before us. They were not the power behind us, which was the almighty hand of life. Like fire at earth's center making mountains, or pent-up waters that cut them through, do you remember the iron band the blacksmith, Shack Dye, welded around the oak on Bennett's lawn, from which to swing a hammock that daughter Janet might repose in, reading on summer afternoons? And that the growing tree at last sundered the iron band? But not a cell in all the tree knew aught save that it thrilled with life, nor cared because the hammock fell in the dust with Milton's poems. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Godwin James from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas, October 3rd, 2006. Harry Wilmans, you who fell in a swamp near Manila, following the flag. You were not wounded by the greatness of a dream, or destroyed by ineffectual work, or driven to madness by satanic snags. You were not torn by aching nerves, nor did you carry great wounds to your old age. You did not starve, for the government fed you. You did not suffer, yet cry, forward, to an army which you led against a foe with mocking smiles sharper than bayonets. You were not smitten down by invisible bombs. You were not rejected by those for whom you were defeated. You did not eat the savorless bread which a poor alchemy had made from ideals. You went to Manila, Harry Wilmans, while I enlisted in the bedraggled army of bright-eyed, divine youths, who surged forward, who were driven back and fell, sick, broken, crying, shorn of faith, 
following the flag of the kingdom of heaven. You and I, Harry Wilmans, have fallen in our several ways. Not knowing good from bad, defeat from victory, nor what face it is that smiles behind the demoniac mask. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Number 198. Lyman King. From the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Sean McGahey. December 29th, 2006. You may think, passerby, that fate is a pitfall outside of yourself, around which you may walk by the use of foresight and wisdom. Thus you believe, viewing the lives of other men, as one who in godlike fashion bends over an anthill, seeing how their difficulties could be avoided. But pass on into life. In time you shall see fate approach you, in the shape of your own image in the mirror, or you shall sit alone by your own hearth, and suddenly the chair by you shall hold a guest, and you shall know that guest, and read the authentic message in his eyes. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Caroline Branson From Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Kristen Luoma GreenKRI.com With our hearts like drifting suns, Had we but walked, as often before, The April fields till starlight, Silkened over with viewless gauze the darkness, Under the cliff our trysting place in the wood, Where the brook turns. Had we but passed from wooing, like notes of music that run together, into winning, in the inspired improvisation of love. But to put back of us as a canticle ended, the rapt enchantment of the flesh, in which our souls swooned down, down, where time was not, nor space, nor ourselves, annihilated in love. To leave these behind for a room with lamps, and to stand with our secret mocking self, and hiding itself amid flowers and mandolins, stared at by all between salad and coffee. And to see him tremble and feel myself, prescient as one who signs a bond, not flaming with gifts and pledges heaped with rosy hands over his brow. And then, O oh night, deliberate, unlovely, with all of our wooing blotted out by the winning, in a chosen room in an hour that was known to all. Next day he sat so listless, almost cold, so strangely changed, wonderingly why I wept, till a kind of sick despair and voluptuous madness seized us to make the pact of death. A stalk of the earth sphere frail as starlight, waiting to be drawn once again into creation's stream, but next time to be given birth, gazed at by Raphael and St. Francis, sometimes as they pass. For I am their little brother, to be known clearly face to face, through a cycle of birth hereafter run. You may know the seed and the soil, you may feel the cold rain fall, but only the earth's fear, only heaven, knows the secret of the seed in the nuptial chamber under the soil. Throw me into the stream again, give me another trial, save me, Shelley. End of poem.